Our world has changed and changing at a rapid rate. As our backyards are getting smaller, we're becoming more connected to a global community. And as these changes have occurred, they're negatively affecting our young people, especially adolescent girls. I would say adolescent girls are bombarded with images more than anyone else of how they should look and how they should behave. And celebrities in particular provide a host of role models that are perhaps inappropriate uh, a lot of the time. But celebrities aren't the only ones to blame. From a young age, girls learn from storybook characters that reinforce females as the weaker sex, waiting to be saved by a strong male. Indeed, I saved my biggest scorn for Cinderella. Cinderella spends her whole life living with her mean stepmother and stepsisters until she is saved by the handsome prince. I certainly don't want my two-year-old daughter growing up thinking that she has to wait for a male to come along and save her from her circumstances. In this presentation, I'm going to explain to you who Dora the Explorer is and why I consider her to be a good role model for adolescent girls. I'm going to address some of the issues facing adolescent girls, particularly around physical inactivity, because whether we know this or not, adolescents and children are probably doing more organised sport than they ever have before, but their incidental activity and particularly their transportation modes have changed considerably over time, and children are not as active as they used to be. And adolescent girls, pretty much, in, and, adolescent, uh, and children as well, girls are always less active than boys. Part of this has to do with increased uh, screen-based recreation. I'm going to talk about this issue. And I'm also going to talk about how self-esteem and, and resilience are linked into these two issues. For those of you who don't know, Dora the, this is Dora the Explorer. She's a seven-year-old cartoon character whose best friend is a monkey called Boots. In every episode of Dora, she goes on an adventure to find something or help someone. Now, I'm pretty sure that the creators of Dora weren't thinking about non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is also known as NEAT. This is the energy that we expend doing everything that is not sleeping, eating, drinking, and sports like exercise. So it's all incidental activity. But Dora the Explorer is a great endorsement for the public health message that physical activity is an opportunity, not an inconvenience. She also loves to climb and swing from vines. And what's interesting is that the most recent physical activity recommendations for young people actually include a specific guideline promoting muscular fitness. And now this is sort of kind of unique and this is sort of emerging in the literature. Perhaps the authors of these guidelines have been watching a few episodes of Dora. But most importantly, Dora walks everywhere. She loves to walk. I'm yet to read a Dora book <laughs> that involved Dora being dropped off on her adventures in her parents' four-wheel drive. I've never seen her being dropped off at school either, but um, I can only assume that she either rides a bike or walks to school. Active transportation, that is walking or cycling, riding a scooter, active transportation to school is an important source of physical activity for young people. And evidence tells us that those who use active transportation tend to be fitter and leaner than those who use passive forms like getting a lift in the car. Now, rates of active transportation have changed dramatically over time. Probably what we have seen more than anything is an increased reliance on motorised transportation, with the biggest changes taking place before the 21st century. If we look at data from the US, we saw from 69 to 2001 that rates of active transportation decreased by about 50% and have remained pretty much low, and if not lower than that ever since. At the same time in Australia, we saw similar decreases in walking and also active transportation. So this is a big issue. And when we actually look, the most recent data, which comes from the um, New South Wales Schools Physical Activity and Nutrition Survey, tells that almost no girls in high school ride to school and less than 20% walk. Now, that's a little bit of a concern. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, why has that, that happened? Why has active transportation become so unattractive? Why are people, fewer people, fewer children, fewer adolescents walking and cycling to school? Well, there's no doubt that poor urban design and increased traffic flow have contributed to parents' fears 
of stranger danger and potential traffic injury. I can absolutely understand that. But what's ironic is when you actually look at the data, and the evidence suggests that about 20 to 30 percent of the cars on the road in the morning between 8 and 9 in the morning are parents dropping off their children at school. And most of the time, they're traveling distances less than two kilometers. So I can certainly understand this is an issue. I actually ride to work. And when I hop on my bike every morning to ride to work, I feel a bit like that frog from the 80s arcade game, Frogger. <laughs> do you remember that one? Anyway, Frogger, what he has to do is he has to, get, has to hop across the road, the busy road, to the pond without getting squashed by a car, truck, or bus. I feel a bit like that little frog. So what can we do about this? There are certainly things that we need to do to make active transportation safer and more appealing for young people. Well, evidence tells us by age 10, a child has the spatial awareness skills to cross a road safely. So I have a few suggestions for things that people can do to make it better for everyone. First thing I would suggest is that treat every cyclist and pedestrian as if they are your own child. Now, everyone has a story about a reckless cyclist doing stupid things on the road. But the difference is, when a cyclist is being careless, it's generally only their life that they're putting at risk, no one else's. Also, I encourage you to cycle with your children. There are lots of fantastic places for cycling, particularly in Newcastle. And I, coming back here from living away, I don't understand why there aren't more people cycling. And we have problems with our environment, but I'll talk about that in a moment. The Fernley Track and the Foreshore are wonderful places. Which sort of leads me, to, leads me to my next point about advocating for change. Local councils are responsible particularly uh, for a lot of roads around local primary and high schools, and they certainly can be influenced if you lobby and try to create change, especially if you get the media involved. We certainly need to make active transportation a more viable and safer option for, our, for everyone. It's of additional concern that physical activity levels decline dramatically during adolescence, and this decline tends to be steeper in adolescent girls. In fact, when we look at evidence from longitudinal studies, and this one in particular, this demonstrated that girls' activity declined by 80% from the period of start of childhood to adolescence. Now, there's lots of reasons for this decline, sociological, psychological, and there are even some biological explanations for that decline. But considering the extensive benefits of activity, and the existing low levels, we certainly need to do more to get adolescent girls to be engaged in activity. Now, if you don't know this, Dora started her life in a computer game. She's a computer game character. But I've yet to see an episode where she's talking on the phone, using the internet, or watching TV. She's always active. But there's also no doubt that an increase in attractive screen-based recreation has given our youth a plethora of ways to remain physically inactive. In fact, when we look at data from all over the world, and particularly in the developed countries, it would tell us the children and adolescents spend on average two to four hours a day, seven, two to four hours a day in screen-based recreation and five to ten hours a day being sedentary. Now, if you don't know, the Australian recommendations around screen time are no less than two hours a day in screen-based recreation. So that's watching TV for non-school purposes, using the computer, talking on the phone for non-school purposes. That's very important to remember. In our own study, and we did a study um, with adolescent girls, about 400 girls across Newcastle and Central Coast, we found that 90% of the girls exceeded those recommendations, and most of them were in three to four hours a day of screen time every single day. So why is this such a concern? Well, in adults, the evidence is absolutely compelling. That's what I'd have to tell you guys. <laughs> a recent review tells us that in adults, increased sitting time is associated with type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality. So at this point in time, I'm going to ask everyone to stand up, <laughs> get out of your seats, Stretch those legs. Everyone's loving that, aren't you? That's good. Stretch up. Very nice. Now, sit back down. You could remain standing, but I think we might obscure a few, few people's views. But breaking up sitting time, breaking up sitting time like that is important for your health. So it's the prolonged sitting that is a real concern. 
In young people, it's an issue as well. And again, a recent review has just come out, over 200 studies showing that more than two hours a day watching TV associated with decreased fitness, increased body fat, lower academic achievement, and poor self-esteem. In our own study of adolescent girls, we found that regardless of how active a girl was, and we, we certainly know that there's a strong positive relationship between how active someone is and their self-esteem, regardless of how active they were, regardless of, of their level of body fat, excessive screen time was associated with poor self-esteem. Now, this is hardly surprising when you consider the, the, the airbrush pictures of perfection that saturate our media and influence the minds of young people. And obviously, there are lots of problems around that. So what do we do about it? What can we do? I guess the first thing that I would suggest, and probably most importantly, is having household rules around screen time, around what is acceptable in the household. I have a four-year-old boy, and he loves watching TV, absolutely. And I think most parents could probably um, can, uh, feel for me there. When the TV's on, he, uh, Santa Claus could climb down our chimney with a sack full of toys, and he would not even blink an eyelid. He's absolutely engrossed. But after several months of tantrums and um, a few toys kicked and a few unpleasant words, he now accepts that he has to stick by our rules and recommendations. Second, by high school, adolescents, especially adolescent girls, are very sedentary at school. It's not like in, in primary school where kids run around a lot of the time and they have PE and they have school sport. By high school, most of, the, most of the time is spent sitting down at a desk or sitting down in the playground. So when a, when a child comes home from school, the period of time between the finish of school and dinner time is an important window of opportunity for physical activity. This is when they shouldn't be watching TV, they shouldn't be playing computer games, they should be outside doing things. My final message is around the dinner table. And I encourage you to eat your dinner at the dinner table with the TV turned off. Sounds like I'm preaching here, but research tells us that if we eat dinner with the TV on, we're more likely to eat more food and we're also more likely to eat energy-dense processed foods. So these are some of the things that I think are helpful. But you know what I like most about Dora? Her persistence, problem-solving and willingness to take calculated risks. She is what we would call a resilient child. She's not afraid of failing and she's going to stick at a task until she succeeds. Now, I'm pretty sure that if Dora was locked in a tower, she would not be waiting for some man to come along and save her. <laughs> I kind of think of Dora as the MacGyver of the cartoon world. <laughs> now, this concept of resilience is, has gained considerable attention in recent years. And while there's various variations in the definitions of what resilience actually is, it's generally agreed upon that it involves external as well as internal characteristics. So ideally, a child should be receiving positive, adult, uh, positive relationships with their, with their parents and teachers in the, in the home, school and community environments. They should have high expectations from people in those settings. And these will help to build strong internal assets like problem solving skills, empathy, and probably very importantly, confidence. All of these things lead to improved social and emotional wellbeing and obviously health and physical implications. Now, lack of resilience in adolescence especially is associated with drug use and, good, and high levels of resilience is a protective factor against mental illness. Because what we've seen is that when individuals have resilience, they tend to bounce back from difficult situations like being bullied at school or the death of a friend or relative. These are the sorts of things that we really want our children to have, absolutely. So what can we do? What's, what are the opportunities out there? I guess the, my first message is around physical challenge and risk-taking, which sounds a little, bit obs a little bit odd, and it's certainly consistent with some of the messages that you've heard today. I encourage adolescent girls to take physical challenges, to get out there, go rock climbing, do a martial arts class, do things that are physically challenging that are going to help lead to that sense of self-accomplishment. Weight training, resistance training, fitness classes, good for self-esteem. But it's all about being physically active and physically challenge yourself. Set physical activity targets and goals, and, and pedometers are quite useful for this target. I'm not suggesting that adolescent girls sail solo around the world. <laughs> Some might. But there are lots of things that we can do, and lots of things that adolescent girls can do, 
that are going to help build their self-esteem, that sense of accomplishment, and lead to a more resilient individuals. Secondly, it's really important that young people do switch off from the world. Find some time each day, shut down the internet, turn off the TV, shut down the computer, and remove yourself from that situation. You might have to wait until tomorrow morning to find out why Kim dumped Chris, but I'm sure your friends will tell you why that was the case. Finally, communicate with friends and family. Uh, adolescence is, is a difficult time. I, in my day, when I was growing up, bullying took place in the school and it finished when you got home and there was that sort of relief and that escape from it. But that doesn't happen now because a child can go home, log onto their Facebook and then the messages and the bullying, that continues on. Now that's, that's, that's a hard world to live in. And I'm yet to be convinced that that any form of online communication, as, as useful as TED is, is as nice as being in the same room as someone, <laughs> communicating face to face. So, what we saw in the 1990s was a dramatic shift in parenting styles and, and an obsession with child safety. Now, there is no doubt that this reduced children's opportunity for physical activity and also their opportunity for physical challenge, the whole helicopter parent thing following the child around, make sure they don't scrape their knee. No doubt. We all have a role to play. And I, when I say all, oh, parents, individuals, teachers, politicians, workers, everyone. It's funny, but I think we can learn a simple life lesson from a seven-year-old cartoon character with a desire for adventure. Now, as a finishing thought, I was kind of wanted to finish one slide to, to finish the presentation. And I was, I was playing in the backyard. This is a true story. Playing in the backyard with my children um, yesterday and um, went inside to grab them a drink. And I came back, and this is the image that I was met with. <laughs> I think my daughter's seen too many, Dora, my, my daughter's seen too many Dora storybooks. She just happened to be dressed in purple and pink as well. Thank you very much for listening.